Give me a break. A vision for research. Stefanie Reich, Freie Universität Berlin. The fall of 1989 was a defining time in my life. I was actually waiting very much to which quote um, you've picked for me. Um, I beg to differ about November 9th, uh, 20 years ago, because the next sentence, um, in the next sentence I said that the most defining month for me was October 89 and not November 89, the time when the revolution in Eastern Germany started. And um, it took me, in fact, two years before I realized the impact of the fall of the wall um, on my life and the life of my fellow countrymen. When Sebastian Turner asked me to speak today, he explained he was looking for a statement on the ideal place for research and at the same time a more specific view at Berlin. So how would you foster breakthroughs? And before starting dreaming too much, remember you're talking about this city, you're talking about Berlin. And this was a moment when he generated the response that's now the title of my talk. Oh, it has disappeared. Give me a break. Well, to explain my vision of the ideal research environment, let me use the example of the scientists after whom the Einstein Foundation is named. During his professional life, Albert Einstein has held three main positions. He was, we have heard it before today, he was a patent officer in Bern, the director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Physics in Berlin, and then finally a fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton. In all three places, Einstein made seminal contribution to modern physics and engineering. Nevertheless, Einstein's fame does not date from his time in Berlin or in Princeton, two well-known and very well-funded research institutes. He's most famous for the work he's done in Berlin, uh, in Bern. Um, both the equation on the equality of mass and energy, E, is equal to M times C squared, a famous formula, I think most of you know, um, as well as a postulate of light as a particle, that was a postulate that aimed him, uh, earned him the Nobel Prize, these two things were both researched, written, and published while Einstein was working in Bern. And indeed, the story of the young man at the patent office is very well known and something most of us remember about Albert Einstein. I believe it was no coincidence that Einstein was at the peak of his creativity in Bern. He found three main ingredients there. His big question, the necessary resources and people to bounce his ideas off. So let me talk about these three points in a little more detail. And let me start by the last one, the people. Bright researchers working jointly or side by side are the key for scientific breakthroughs. All you need to do to have a great place for research is get talent to your place. This is essentially an hen and an egg problem because famous people have a tendency to go to famous places and it is really hard to found a new place or to improve on a place using this concept. Einstein's story, however, has an easy solution to the problem and it also bears a moral to every university that wants to be associated with a great discovery. When trying to hire a world-famous person, get them before they're famous. Now, I know this is easier said than done, but we all believe that we can tell talent once we see it. We should ask ourselves how to see talent from farther away, how to identify it. We should learn how to identify the brightest graduate students, the brightest postdocs in our field. And then let us ask them what they need and provide exactly this. This might be the opportunity to uh, lead the first independent research group. This might be two years to build a new experiment. 
a great mentor, access to a particular archive, the opportunity to switch fields, whatever it takes. Career opportunities for young academics, I remember that very well, are typically shaped by the sites that give the funding, be it a research foundation, be it a university or research institute. Why not turn this around and listen to the need of the young instead? One thing I miss since coming back from the United States two years ago is diversity. I left the department with ethnically and culturally very diverse faculty and students' body. Many of my colleagues in the faculty were women. And I went into an environment that's predominantly white, German, and male. We miss talent, and we also miss wall-breaking question if you rely on such a limited pool of talent to draw from. Why not start with the talent we have in Germany? Let Berlin become the place for women and second or third generation immigrants to go to. Let us provide research and networking opportunity for these people as well as prestigious awards and fellowships. The discussion about attracting foreign talent to German universities currently concentrates on bringing Germans back from North America, from North America mainly the United States, and getting graduate students from East and South Asia, typically China and India. I think Berlin should aim for its own niche instead of following these very well-traveled routes. Right now, Berlin feels a little bit like the border, the eastern border of Western Europe. But this is the city of the wall. This was the city where East and West met. So let, Berlin, let us bring Berlin back where it belongs, into the middle of Europe. Let us invite students from Eastern Europe, young researchers from Southeastern Europe, collaborate with groups in countries of the former Soviet Union. For highly educated Ukrainian scientists, for example, Germany is much more attractive than for a recent graduate of a prestigious Chinese university. I believe there are more geographical areas that are currently overlooked by American admit admission officers, and we should search for them. The quality of a place for research depends largely on your colleagues and students, and here we should aim for the very best. <coughs> Resources and infrastructure. In Einstein's case, this was a particularly easy task. All he needed was time for thinking, period. Einstein later complained bitterly about all his additional duties and his fame that made it difficult for him to work. I do not want to discuss the question of resources and infrastructure in great detail. The necessary resources differ too much from field to field. Today, you've heard example of breakthroughs requiring huge efforts in terms of resources and infrastructure. Um, you heard about fusion, about um, CERN, big infrastructural projects. And you also heard about breakthroughs, for example, our sole mathematician, that hardly require any resources. I believe this question is heavily debated in our daily scientific life, and sometimes it is overvalued. Therefore, let me leave this topic and talk about the last point, the big questions. This conference evolved, revolved around finding the big questions of all walls to tear down. We had many inspiring ideas of which challenges to tackle. For some of us, there will be one big question like for Einstein, who spent his life thinking about space, time, and matter. For others, the defining question will be a bit smaller and will change during their career. Nevertheless, we should establish and foster a culture of looking for the big questions instead of moving incrementally from one project to the next. Such a breakthrough culture needs to be introduced as early as possible. Why do we teach our students so much about problems that have been solved? Why not tell them at least as much about the open questions and how to find new challenges? This would require quite a change to our current curricula, but one that's worthwhile trying. When looking for our own personal big challenge, 
We typically derive them from an inspiring discussion, a talk we listen to. Today, we've also heard about childhood memories. I would like to add a local component to the mix. Let us work on finding wall-breaking questions we want to answer here in this city. The Einstein Foundation could provide a platform to shape the defining questions by bringing together Berlin's scientists from both cultures, society, and politics. 20 years ago, at this time of the day, it's almost 7 o'clock, the famous press conference by Schabowski was already over. The wall, however, remained standing. <coughs> it was not Schabowski who brought down the wall. Neither it was Kohl or any other politician. Also, they'd love you to believe that. It was the East German people who brought down the wall. They stood in front of the Iron Curtain, demanding the wall to fall. Thanks to their peaceful persistence, the gates finally opened shortly before midnight. As you heard today, Angela Merkel was among the masses in the Bornholmer Straße, the first place where the wall opened. This picture, this story of the fall down of the wall is a great metaphor for scientific breakthroughs. And I think there are some lessons to be learned, and here they are. First one, walls are not necessarily broken down by famous people. The second one, it takes persistent and joint effort to break down a wall. And finally, some people have a great career and get famous after the breakthrough. These are not always the ones who opened the gates, but the ones who best understood the implications. Thank you very much. Thank you.